If you go back to the beginning of the course, you got one of those syllabi that outline the topics that we're going to cover in the course. And on the front page are a list of all the different course objectives. And the last of the course objectives, I think, in order was understanding and applying Green's theorem. And I'm sure you've been waiting for that moment when we would get to Green's theorem. Well, today is your day. We're at Green's theorem, which is one of the last big topics that we cover in Calc 3. And look, even Green's theorem is green on the PowerPoint. And again, I'll let you take a look at the actual prepared PowerPoint that I had with all the pictures and everything. But the idea is to think about a paddle wheel. You've got a paddle wheel at a point inside of a curve. So the curve is oriented in a certain direction. And as the curve goes around, it's throwing off these tangent vectors. But the strength of the rotation is going to depend on how fast that little paddle wheel spins. So if that paddle wheel is spinning very quickly, you're going to get a much greater rotation than if that paddle wheel was spinning more slowly. And then, of course, the direction makes a difference, too. So in this case, it's got a positive counterclockwise circulation on the curve. You can see the vector field. You can see the tangents that are being thrown off as that paddle wheel spins and the thing circulates. So great. What do we do with this? We're going to look at this as a quantity in R2, right? this gx minus fy. So it's going to tell us the two-dimensional curl of the vector field. Is the change of g in the x direction greater than or less than the change of f in the y direction? So if that number is positive, you got a counterclockwise rotation. If it's negative, you got a clockwise rotation. And if the curl is 0, then you don't have any rotation. It's moving in one direction as much as it's moving in the other direction. So we have a name for that, too. We just don't call it zero rotation. We call it irrotational. So if the curl is zero, it's irrotational. There's two different forms of Green's theorem. Green's theorem links line integrals to the curl of a vector field. So there's a circulation form, and then there's a flux form. So back when we did circulation, we said you could calculate a circulation as f dot dr. But there's another way to calculate circulation, too, which is as the integral of f with respect to x plus the integral of g with respect to y. Green's theorem then says you can also write that as the partial g with respect to x minus the partial f with respect to y. These three things all being equal, sometimes it's easier to calculate it one way than the other. So it takes the circulation of a vector field and links it back to that f dot dr. And so it allows us to evaluate line integrals more simply. So let's take a look at a somewhat simple example, um, evaluating this vector field x, y, where r is the unit circle centered at the origin. So if r is the unit circle centered at the origin, we know how to write the equation for a unit circle centered at the origin. It's just going to be x squared plus y squared equals 1. And in fact, we can then take that along with our vector field, which is f equals x, y, and we can take the derivative of the first component with respect to y, and we can take the derivative of the second component with respect to x. For this, we get 0, and for that, we get 0. So what does that mean? That means that the two-dimensional curl is 0, and it's irrotational. Is that the same thing as integrating f dot dr? Well, let's find out. If x squared plus y squared equals 1, then x is equal to cosine of t, y is equal to sine of t. And then if I derive that, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, the derivative of sine is cosine. So this first thing is my f. This second thing here is my dr. All right, so now take the dot product of those two. Cosine times negative sine is negative sine t cosine t plus sine t cosine t. That gives me 0. And so if I were to integrate from 0 to 2 pi of 0 dt, I'll just get zero. 
So I haven't solved for anything earth shattering yet. All I've done is I've noted that I can check both sides of that equation. And in this case, they come out to be the same. What did I do? I calculated the two dimensional curl, which is zero, which means that it is irrotational. All right, let's take a look at this. And I want to look at this in two different ways. All right, so I've got some vector field of negative 3y, 3x, except this time the region on the bottom is bounded by three points, which means it's a triangle, and is said it specifically went in the direction from the first point to the last. First point to the last looks like what? Well, here's 0, 0. From there it went to 1, 0. And from there, it went to 0, 2. So, and then it would come back down to 0, 0. So that was a starting point. So it's a closed curve, and I can set it up in parameters form if I want, and I could even evaluate it as a double integral. So the vector field is negative 3y, 3x. All right, so the vector field is negative 3y, 3x. If you go back to that triangle, there was a line that went down like this. There we go. Where this was 0, 2, and that was 1, 0. So the equation of that line then must be a line with a y-intercept of 2 and a slope that does what? Goes down 2 to the right 1. So down 2 to the right 1 is negative 2. The equation of that line then, y equals mx plus b, mx plus b. Remember when that stuff was like the hardest thing in the world to do when you were in high school algebra 1? And now you just do it off the top of your head. All right, so there's my vector field. If f is equal to negative 3y and g is equal to 3x, if I take the derivative of f with respect to y, I get negative 3. If I take the derivative of g with respect to x, I get positive 3. The whole idea of Green's theorem is I can take this situation and I can set it up as a double integral. I can set it up as a double integral, partial g with respect to x minus partial f with respect to y, to save me from having to write these things all in parametric form. All right, the g with respect to x we said was 3. The f with respect to y we said was negative 3. I'm going to integrate this dy dx. I just need limits of integration. Where are my y's going? My y's are going from 0 down here up to the top, which is negative 2x plus 2. So that's where my y's are going. My y's are going from 0 to negative 2x plus 2. All right, my x's are going from left to right. So the x's going from left to right are going from 0 to 1. Now we evaluate. So 3 minus a negative 3 is 6. So this will give me 6dy, value integrated from 2 to negative 2x plus 2. So basically it gives me 6 times negative 2x plus 2, which gives me negative 12x plus 12. Now I integrate that from 0 to 1. Okay, so now integrate from 0 to 1 of negative 12x plus 12 with respect to x. So that'll give me negative 12x squared over 2 plus 12x. So negative 12 over 2 is negative 6 plus 12 gives me 6. Okay. That means that the two-dimensional curl is not equal to 0. Now, is there another way that I could have done this? Sure. If you go back to the definition there was a part of the definition that had a DA in it. Here it is. 
So I can integrate over some region, integrate it with respect to the area. What if I set up that inside piece, right? That three minus a negative three, gx minus fy, and I did three minus a negative three, and I got six. And then I took that six, and I multiplied it by the area of the base. So the area of the base is a triangle, one half base times height. Well, the base is one, and the height is two. So the area of the base is one. So I could have done simply six times the area of the base, right? So that is my, that is my area. I don't know what happened there. And so I could have taken that six, multiplied it by the area, and gotten six. In this case, yeah, it's a shortcut, right? The integration, though, wasn't too terrible. But where it saves you is when you have these crazy kind of bases where you have like two parabolas intersecting each other or something. You can use Calc 1 techniques to find the area of the base and then just multiply that area of the base times the derivative of g with respect to x minus the derivative of f with respect to y, and you will get the same answer. All right, this, I think, is kind of a neat application of Green's theorem in that you can find area inside a closed curve using the conditions of Green's theorem. And that allows us to find areas inside things like ellipses. Right? You know how to find a formula for the area inside of a circle, pi r squared. How do you find an area inside of an ellipse? Well, it turns out there is a geometric formula for it. You may or may not have seen it before. But how do we come up with that geometric formula? Well, take a look at this area of a plane region by line integrals. It says the integral of the closed curve of x integrated with respect to y is the same thing as 1 half the integral of x dy minus y dx. And the idea is that I can set these all up in parametric form and then simply combine them and integrate them. All right, so let's try this example with an ellipse. Find the area inside this ellipse. So again, you remember what this ellipse looks like. It has x-intercepts of 2 and negative 2 has y-intercepts of 3 and negative 3. So this one is taller than it is wide. The y-axis is the major axis, and it's centered at the origin. How do I set up an ellipse in parametric form? Well, if it's going from 0 to 2 and 0 to negative 2, my x is going to be 2 cosine t. Then my y is going to be 3 sine t. If this were a circle, those coefficients would be the same. It would be whatever the radius of the circle is. But this is not a circle. It's an ellipse. Right, so now derive each one. The derivative of x in terms of t is going to be negative 2 sine t, and the derivative of y with respect to t will be 3 cosine t. So this thing says that I should take 1 half the integral of x dy. So 1 half the integral of x dy. So 2 cosine t, 3 cosine t. So there is x dy minus y dx. So minus 3 sine t times negative 2 sine t dt. And I got to go from 0 to 2 pi to make this work. All right, so let's clean this up, move it over a little bit. Integral from 0 to 2 pi. 2 cosine, 3 cosine gives me 6 cosine squared t. Positive, a negative 3 times negative 2 gives me positive 6 sine squared t dt. Oh, this isn't bad. Pull the 6 on the outside. Half of 6 is 3. Integral from 0 to 2 pi. You realize cosine squared plus sine squared is just 1. And now you're left with 3 times 2 pi, which is 6 pi. Where does that 6 pi come from? It actually comes from the numbers that are underneath the x squared and the y squared. Go back to when we first set this up. We got that 4, took the square root of 4, and that gave us the 2. We took that 9, took the square root of 9, and got that 3. Turns out that the area of an ellipse, if those numbers under the x squared and y squared are a and b, the area is just pi times a times b. 
because how did we get that six cosine squared and that six sine squared? We did a two times three over here. We did a three times two over there. And then as we worked through the formula, we ended up multiplying by a half, then multiplying by two pi, the half and the two canceled out. And so this formula here actually works for the area of an ellipse. It's just that when you learned it in geometry, you probably didn't do it with the parametric forms and integrals and such, but that really is where it comes from. All right, I'm going to break this up and do a second video for the second part.